Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Holly Parsons. I run uh, the Urban Birds Program for BirdLife Australia and you're here to check out, of course, um, episode four of BirdLife Australia's Birding at Home Facebook Live events. Um, the Urban Bird Program, of course, involves a huge amount of work on um, bird-friendly gardening. So what I'm hoping to do today is to share some tips and tricks with you on how you can create a space that a lot of different birds love to visit. Um, there's going to be a lot of information. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. So um, you're going to see some links and things in the comments. Go to birdsandbackyards.net for any information that you would like to um, and get some more information. Um, we've got a lot, a lot to cover. Make sure um, if you've got any questions, you pop them in the comments and I'm going to endeavour to get to as many of them as I can at the end of the session today. Um, the topic of bird friendly gardening, as I said, is quite massive. So um, unfortunately, there's not one formula that describes exactly how to create a bird friendly garden. Um, if it did, that'd be awesome. I'd love to be able to let you know, do X, Y, and Z and you will get um, different types of birds. Um, the urban space doesn't quite work like that. Uh, but it also means that we have some flexibility. So you can create a garden that is natural and bushy that attracts birds. You can create one that is much more structured um, and you're still going to get some great birds visiting you. So it means that you can add your own flair and create a space that you're sharing with birds. So it a, has a practical use for you as well as for birds and other wildlife. Uh, we're going to get started with a little bit of information. I'm going to pop some things up um, on your screen to help you out throughout the session. Um, different birds are going to be looking for different things uh, in your garden. And unless you live on a massive property, um, unfortunately, your garden is not going to provide absolutely everything that a bird needs um, to survive. And it's not going to take up residence and not use any other part of the landscape. So think of your garden as a stepping stone. So it is what bird, birds are visiting to get some little resource before they head off um, to other gardens, to a park down the road or a patch of bush in order to um, get everything that they need uh, to survive. So they're looking for food, they're looking for water, they're looking of course for shelter, that's incredibly important, um, and somewhere it's safe that they can um, build a nest and raise some young. So my suggestion is first to think about the types of birds that you want to create a space for. Um, I'm not going to be filling um, the session today with lots of tips on attracting common birds. We have a huge range of birds in Australia that are doing really well in our urban spaces, sometimes a little bit too well. Um, so, you know, rainbow lorikeets, noisy miners, wattle birds, they're all doing great, currawongs and the like. Um, our gardens are fantastic for them. Urban landscapes have created everything that they need. I'm going to be focusing on some of those less common species, particularly the shrub dependent ones. Things like your fairy wrens, thornbills, silver eyes, that used to be much more common in urban spaces than they are now. So I'm going to give you some tips on particular types of plants, um, but of course we're covering all of Australia here, so I'm not going to be giving you specific species of plants. Um, you're going to have to do your own research um, to come up with, with what is suitable for your conditions. Uh, so I think it's really important to actually have a plan in place before you get started in creating a garden. Um, plants can be expensive and so you don't want to go and spend a whole heap of money um, buying a heap of plants on a whim and sticking in the ground and hope for the best. Um, you're better off doing a little bit of research first and you know there's a bit of time around at the moment to do that. Do a bit of research, um, draw what I've got here with my incredible artistic abilities, a mud map. Um, so it's effectively getting you to take a bird's eye view of your garden and draw what's already there. So lay out what you've already got in your space and then think about what you can add to it um, in order to make it more bird friendly. I'd always advise adding to your garden before you start taking a whole heap of things out. If you just go and decide to clean slate your garden and um, take all the vegetation out, of course you're removing any little bit of habitat that um, birds were using. Okay, and so you're not going to get anything coming in unless it's something that just wants to be out on the open lawn. So think about um, adding different um, plants, adding sections to your garden, and then if there's some particular vegetation you don't like, after those plants um, establish, you can then go and remove them. 
So on your mud mat, mark things that are important going forward. So what direction does your garden face? Um, what's, what's the sun like? Where's the shady bits? Uh, what's the prevailing wind? Are you on a slope? Because once you've got this map, it doesn't matter how neat and lovely it is, but once you've got that map, it means that you can go to a nursery, you can take it with you when you're looking at plants, and you can you know, get some local advice and help um, because you've got a bit of a layout and you know the type of thing that you're looking for. It's also helpful to have a think about um, the types of birds that you've got in your area. Um, so make a list of the types of birds that visit your garden now. Um, so I'm a big fan of we do cover of the, with the birds at the moment um, in, on Urban Birds social media. Boil a kettle, take a cup of tea outside, watch the birds and see what you've got visiting you. If you're taking a bit of a walk around the block, of course, start to notice what birds you've got in your neighbourhood so you've got a bit of an idea of the types of birds that you can maybe attract to your garden. Um, I'm also going to put a big plug in here as a great opportunity to do a birds and backyard survey for us. So that's a 20 minute count in your uh, garden, recording the birds through the bird data web portal or the bird data app um, and telling us a little bit about what your garden is like as well. We use that information in the Urban Birds team to give habitat preferences and look at what dif different birds need in gardens and how they are faring. So that information is really important and actually shapes a lot of what I'm telling you today. So you've got your plan in place um, and then you're going to start thinking about what sort of plants you want to put in. Um, I'm going to suggest where you possibly can, getting a hold of locally native plants if at all possible. So um, it might be a bit challenging, nurseries might be closed at the moment where you are, um, so just do a bit of research. Contact your local council, um, they will have at the very least a plant list of um, local to your area so you know what's around naturally and they will be able to hopefully point you in the direction of a great nursery that you can access. Um, they'll also have some fantastic advice as well. Um, of course, locally native is not all that always possible. Native is the next best thing, um, and we do have an amazing array of native plants in Australia um, that we can grow in our gardens. So um, check out things like the Australian Plant Society as well for some, for some more information and some direction uh, from their local branch to where you can get a hold of some plants. Um, native plants fell out of favour a little while ago. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. So native plants often get marketed as being low maintenance. That's true when they're established for the most part, but low maintenance doesn't mean no maintenance. And I think there was this concept, misconception that you just put a native plant in the ground and your job was done. All of a sudden you got these fantastic um, plants growing. Any little baby plant going and put in the ground is gonna need some love and attention. So make sure you are watering them regularly that you're giving them some love and so they can establish really well. Um, it's also really important that native plants get pruned. So one of the other reasons I think they became less popular was because again, they were put in the ground, they grew. If they don't get pruned, native plants tend to grow quite leggy and gangly and they don't look very attractive at all. So in the bush, native plants get pruned. There's little herbivores that come along and they nip out the new growth that tastes really good and that allows shrubs and trees to grow nice and dense because it's forcing those branches out. We need to do that in our gardens. So when you put a native plant in the ground, it's a good idea, particularly for the first six months, to what we call tip prune it. So that means just take out the little bits of new growth that are coming just with your fingers, no fancy equipment, and that will help encourage that um, shrubbiness and density that is going to mean the plant looks a lot more attractive as it grows and it also means that um, the birds are going to love it because it's going to create a lot of structure and it is that structure for birds that is generally the most important thing that you can do. Some plants when they uh, go on uh, a little bit beyond six months if they start to get leggy will need a bit more pruning as well so you can get some um, get some saccateurs out and give it a really good hard prune do a bit of research on the particular plant that you're dealing with to see how well it copes with um, a harsh prune back. Um, but as I said, um, birds 
are everywhere in our gardens and they live in different parts of our gardens. So creating that structure is vital. We get some, some birds that love being out on the open lawn. We have some birds that love hanging around in shrub layer. We have some that love being up in the tree and some that are maybe not necessarily landing in our gardens, but are certainly searching our gardens for food. So birds of prey and the like that are flying overhead and sussing out all the goodies that they might be able to get in your space. So we need to be creating layers in our garden if we want to try and attract a lot of different types of birds into it. If we just have a very typical open lawn, tall tree type garden, then you are going to get those super common guys that are doing really well anyway. You'll get your lorikeets, you'll probably get noisy miners, common or Indian miners, um, those magpie larks that are lovely, but that's the kind of habitat they like, tall trees, open lawn. If you want to encourage a diversity of birds, we need to get the middle layer back in. That's really important. Um, so when you go and start thinking about what plants you want to put in, and I'll give you some suggestions shortly, uh, think about what the plants are providing for the birds. So uh, the plants that you're putting in are going to be providing some shelter because they grow nice and dense or they've got a really nice canopy. Um, are they going to be providing some sort of food? So do you have nice showy flowers that are going to be attracting lots of nectar feeders? Are they attracting lots of insects? Do they have a great seed pod? What sort of resource are these different plants providing? So as you start to compile a list of plants that you want, you're going to make sure that you're covering all your bases. Um, make sure you, as I said, account for all the appetites. So you've got something provided for lots of different types of birds. And particularly if you're short on space, don't think that you have to go out and get 50 different plants of, that are going to provide 50 different things. You're actually probably better off buying three, five, seven of the same plant species and planting them together in a nice little clump. That means that when that flower, when that flowers or fruits, it will generally do it all at the same time. And so there is a lot of that particular resource that's going to be available for the birds to be coming in. As I've said, and I'm going to harp on about it, shrub, 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 shrubs. Get some clumps of shrubs happening. Um, think about a thicket or a hedge of some nice dense shrubs. Um, if you've got a corner of the yard that's not being used, you know, make a wedge uh, that is a nice dense understory layer that's going to provide a really good space for particularly those shyer, shrub dependent birds like wrens and thornbills and the like places that they can go um, and get some good resources, but importantly, get protection. And that's protection from pets. Um, if you are on the East Coast, it's going to be protection by, from things like noisy miners. Noisy miners do phenomenally well because we've created a great space for them. They love eucalypts and their traditional habitat is on the edge of woodlands. So they like a lot of um, grassy understory. We throw in some of the bird friendly plants um, that, that get marketed around the bottle brush hybrid grevilleas, the big, big showy flowers. We've really created a fabulous space for noisy miners and some of those really dominant cranky bossy birds. Um, they then create problems because they will chase away um, a huge diversity of um, the other native birds that we can get in our gardens. So um, I'm going to actually advise that you steer clear a bit of the bird friendly garden, the bird friendly plant label um, and don't necessarily put in those really nectar rich um, big showy plants that just provide lots and lots of flowers year round. Um, but putting in some of those other shrubs means that the little guys have places that they can hide to get away from um, some of those bigger bully birds. So I'm going to go through now and give you um, a few tips and tricks um, on attracting different types of birds, particularly focused on the small birds. Um, so I'm going to suggest some, some broad types of plants uh, that are good for these different birds. So we're going to start off with uh, nectar feeders. Uh, particularly small nectar feeders, so I'm talking the little honey eaters, um, some of your parrots as well. We're thinking about, um, as I said, avoiding those big showy um, plants. If you do want to put in a big um, Robin Gordon grevillea or a bottle brush, just put one in. Don't go nuts and have a huge amount of flowering um, nectar-rich plants in your garden because you will encourage those really dominant bossy birds 
which means that the little guys don't really stand much of a chance. So just because a honey eater is little doesn't mean that it's not cranky. Uh, if anybody's had a New Holland honey eater in their garden, you'll know that they love um, trying to chase away anything else, even though they are invariably a lot smaller. Um, it just means that when they're little, the other birds don't really pay a huge amount of attention to them. So think about some of the native plants that are quite tubular in flowers. So things like corias, which are just starting to flower at the moment and are looking amazing. Um, some of the apacrids, the really heath um, type plants that have got really nice little tubes. A little tubular flower means a little tiny beak, uh, long beak that a spinebill or something has can get in there, but some of those big buffy beaks can't get into. Um, while I've sort of steered clear of, of the big showy nectar producing plants, I am going to give a push for banksias. Um, they are amazing. Um, they do have big flowers that produce a lot of nectar, but unlike some of these um, hybrid grevilleas and bottle brushes, they have a shorter flowering time for the most part. So they will flower, they'll have a, a huge amount of nectar, the honey eaters and things will come in and use it. Then of course, once the, the flower dies off, you have this amazing seed head. Um, and you will get cockatoos, if you're lucky, uh, some of the black cockies will come in and take those seed heads and give them a good crunch. Uh, and then of course flowering time is over. So it means that, that all the honey eaters then just move off in search of um, other flowering plants. Um, I've banged on a little bit about uh, grevilleas. There are a huge amount of grevilleas out there and I'm definitely not saying don't put a grevillea in. There is an incredible diversity um, of grevilleas that you can go for. Just try and go for something with a smaller flower. Um, so some of the spider flowers uh, are absolutely beautiful. Uh, there are a whole range out there. So just do a little bit of research as to what's around in your area um, and certainly pop some grevilleas in. Um, we're talking shrubs and into sort of small trees for these honey eaters as well. Of course, um, eucalypts are going to be fantastic for, for honey eaters and a huge range of birds and they tend to be the dominant canopy tree that we have that are native in our, um, in our urban areas. If you're going to put a eucalypt in, just think really carefully, um, and this actually goes in general for any of the plants you're putting in the ground, about where you're going to put it. Um, eucalypts grow huge in a lot of cases, so you need to make sure that 20, 30 years down the track, you, are not, you have not got a plant that is going to become a problem because it is way too big and it's potentially getting dangerous. So any plant you put in the ground, work out how big it's supposed to grow and how wide it's supposed to grow. So of course you're going to be creating a great habitat and not crowding out your garden with uh, plants that are not going to do very well because they're going to be outcompeted with each other. Um, so next we're going to cover off on insectivores. Some of my favourite little birds, um, this is the little superb fairy wren of course. Um, for a lot of insectivorous birds, uh, the shrub layer again is incredibly important. For something like a little fairy wren here, that's where they spend a lot of their time is, is the shelter that a shrub provides. In the case of the fairy wren, they actually like a bit of open lawn space, so that's where they do all their feeding. They're going to be coming out on the lawn, hopping around really happily, eating lots of insects and then coming back into the shrubs for protection. But insects are incredibly important in your garden. We actually need to have a really diverse and really healthy insect and invertebrate life in order to have a really healthy garden. So think about um, attracting, putting in plants that are going to attract a lot of insects. Um, don't be scared of insects. The birds will come in and um, take care of them before they can become a problem. But of course, um, insects and invertebrates in the soil are going to be really important to keep uh, your soil healthy, which in turn keeps your plants happy and healthy as well. So make sure that you're mulching um, really, really well. Uh, so a good layer of mulch down around your plants keeps the soil healthy, keeps the water in the soil, and also creates a great place for birds to be hunting uh, for insects and invertebrates. Uh, nectar producing plants you'll know are a hive of insect activity so absolutely those nectar producing plants that I suggested are going to be great for, for attracting insects to your garden but there are a lot of particularly white and yellow flowering plants that might not have huge showy uh, flowers on them but have little flowers that are really great particularly for attracting insects. Um, a lot of these plants also to create great structure so Things like kunzias, um, which have amazing white flowers, or you can get beautiful purple little powder puff flowers on them, are gorgeous. They can also grow really nice and dense. They're quite a tall shrub. 
Um, so they're providing lots of cover. Hakeas likewise attract a lot of insects and you can get some really nice spiky ones which are really good for little birds to hide out in and lots of little birds like little finches will like to nest in them as well. Prickly plants, prickly natives are fantastic for creating great shelter. Just think really carefully about where you're going to put them. You don't want to stick a, a hakea sericea, you know, a, a really prickly hakea right in the uh, right on the side of the garden path where you're going to be brushing past it daily and getting spiked. Think about putting your prickly plants behind some others so you've got some nice um, structure and you've got some nice protection for you um, as well. Uh, there's a whole range of other plants. I've got them listed here. Of course, wattles, acacias, um, you know, when they're in flower, come August, September, you can see all the amazing um, insects around them. Um, Bessarias, again, nice white little flower. Tea trees, great, particularly along the coast. Um, and melaleucas as well. They're going to produce a little bit of nectar, but they're going to have little flowers that attract a lot of insects and also create great structure for birds. So we're going to move on to some of the seed eaters now. So with seed eaters, I'm talking, you know, little little finches and the like, like the little red-browed finch here, uh, a lot of your parrots, uh, some of the pigeons and things too, good old crested pigeons love a bit of seed. Um, you tend to be finding seed eating birds on the ground or up in sort of in the trees as well. So um, I would suggest having a look around for some great native grasses. Native grasses are not really a lawn replacement. They tend to grow quite tufting and quite tall. So think about them um, in a garden bed. They create a little bit of structure, but it's more the seed head that is that there's going to be developing on things like the kangaroo grass that's going to be great for seed eating birds. Um, but also the leaves, you know, the long strappy leaves from native grasses uh, make great nesting material for a lot of birds as well. So they'll break them off and go and take them off to weave into nests. So think about some of the native grasses. There's a huge diversity of them out there that you can get a hold of. Um, you can also, of course, keep a bit of open lawn space. You don't have to give away your entire garden. Um, to birds. Uh, birds will actually, some birds will like a bit of open lawn. So red rump parrots, fairy wrens, um, a lot of the cockatoos and things will be coming down onto the lawn to look for um, fruits uh, and seeds. Think about, and maybe you can have a little bit of the lawn that you don't mow or mow less frequently. So you can get some seed head on there as well that the native birds will like. Otherwise, um, of course, anything that's going to form a nice seed is often going to be favoured by a lot of seed-eating birds. So as I said, banksias with cockatoos, um, they'll also like chewing on the hakeas um, after they finish flowering. And of course, wattles have those great little seed pods on them as well. Um, I'm just going to finish off talking about um, the types of birds and cover off on some fruit eaters. Um, so we have a lot of fruit-eating birds around. Um, fruit-eating birds can cause a little bit of chaos sometimes, um, particularly uh, to do with spreading weeds. So if you've got um, some exotic plants in your gardens that have got have good fruit on them, particularly if they are a weed, so things like um, privet, please try and get it removed, even though those sort of plants are great for birds. Um, the problem is they're great for birds because the birds are eating the fruit and then spreading those, uh, those seeds into more natural areas, which in, in turn spreads the weeds. So instead, look at some of the um, native plants that we, we've got that provide great um, fruit um, for things like, again, a lot of your parrots. Um, they've got quite a wide diet. Um, a lot of the um, fruit doves, um, bowerbirds, silver eyes, um, of one of the little birds that do like eating a little bit of fruit. Uh, the plants that tend to uh, produce fruit are wet forest or rainforest species for the most part and tend to be trees. So you need to think about whether you've got um, some good space to put in something like a lily pilly that can grow absolutely enormous. Um, and of course, the bonus of the lily pilly is that we can eat the fruit as well. So it enables you to make a bit of a bush tucker garden too. So of course, figs, huge plants. So think about a space that is good for those. Um, blueberry ash as well on the east coast has a beautiful fruit that a lot of birds, like the little fig bird that I just showed before, will like to eat. Um, and of course, if you are sort of in the northern areas of Australia, you can think about palms, um, you know, some of our native palms. Um, again, make sure they're in the right spot.
um, because these are really tall trees. Um, there is a lot of fruit that can sometimes drop fruit as well, uh, and you'll get a hive of um, activity at them when they are fruiting. There are also some different vines, particularly things like your longer wonga vine, uh, that have fruit on them as well. So um, vines can be great because they can create density really quickly. Um, you can pop them in the ground or pop them next to, um, next to some shrubs and they'll grow up and fill in the space a bit. Um, I learned a lesson not to go too nuts with vines because I now have a native garden that is getting a little bit overrun and I'm spending a lot of time actually cutting the vines back um, because they are um, they're overgrowing a lot of my, my native plants. Um, so a few vines in selectively can, can do really well. One thing I did um, which has gone well is I had a, a small section of my um, yard which didn't have a fence at the front. We basically put in some star pickets and some wire and have grown some hardened berger um, up it, um, which is sometimes called a native sarsaparilla as well. Um, it's then created you know, a fabulous um, living fence um, that's great for little birds to pop in and out of, as well as having um, some great flowers on it too. So that's all I'm going to cover on the types of plants that you can put in for birds. I wanted to um, move on to just a couple of um, features that you can also add to your garden to make it more bird friendly. Um, I'm going to talk about bird baths shortly, but um, first up, think about leaving some branches, um, you know, maybe there's some logs, a few rocks in and amongst your garden as well, because a bird friendly garden should be a wildlife friendly garden. Um, and so if we want to help some of our um, carnivorous birds, we're going to want to attract, you know, a few different other types of wildlife into our garden too. So, you know, a, a frog pond, fantastic. You know, some, some leaf litter and some logs on the ground, some branches are going to be great hiding spots for lizards, um, which in turn means that if you've got things like bow, um, butcher birds around or kookaburras, they're going to have a field day um, in your garden. But onto bird baths is a really nice and easy way that you can um, create a great resource for birds and you will get birds visiting you. Uh, there's a, just a few little tips to remember. It's pretty easy stuff. There's a lot of flexibility with how you can do bird baths. Just make sure that your bird bath is kept clean um, and it's in a cool position. So you don't want it out in the hot midday sun um, because, you know, it's going to get too hot for birds to visit. Um, you'll also notice that if you put a bird bath out in the middle of the yard, um, you're going to attract the birds that are quite confident at being out in the middle of the yard. So you're going to be getting um, your cockatoos, magpies, uh, currawongs, lorikeets, um, those guys that, you know, stand up to everybody else and are quite confident at being out there are going to do fine. But if um, you put your bird baths um, in a few more secluded areas, so particularly bird baths that are close to some shrubs or a tree, it means that um, other birds that are less confident than some of these guys will come and use them because they will feel safe. So birds want to be able to see that there's no approaching danger. So you don't want them smack bang in the middle of a shrub because, you know, there could be a cat or something that's going to jump out at them. So put it somewhere where the birds know that they feel safe. There's a little bit of space around it. Um, but they have an escape route. So there is a shrub right next to it. There is a tree branch that they can get to if they need to make a dash for it. You know, birds are very vulnerable when they're, they're having a bath. Um, of course, as I said, keep the water clean. So have your bath so that you can um, empty it out regularly, um, tipping it, you know, onto the garden if you can. That also means that um, you, the water won't stagnate, so you won't be breeding up lots of mozzies. Um, and it just means that the water is kept nice and clean and, and refreshed. You can use a whole range of different types of bird baths. There's lots and lots of ones out there. So use, use your imagination. If you don't have dogs and cats in the yard, um, then a simple plant saucer on the ground is a bird bath. Um, and you'll get a lot of little guys wanting to come in and use those sorts of bird baths. You can go and buy a pedestal bath from a nursery. You can hang a bird bath um, from... Uh, a tree, there are a, a whole range of different options out there. Um, and I, I've got this great example here um, from an amazing photographer, Leanne, who sent me this photo of a, um, a seed pod from a palm. 
um, that she has fashioned into a bird bath literally by just pouring some water in it. So they break down over time and then she just simply gets another one from her garden and fills it in. Um, if your bird bath though is deep or if it is um, glazed, as a lot of the bird baths we buy are, uh, think about putting something in it. So put a brick, a rock, a branch, something so, like you can see here with the silver eye, if a, um, a bird or an, some other wildlife uh, slips, on that slippery surface, they've got something to grip onto so they can get themselves back out of the water. And you'll see that this bird bath here is not a slippery one, um, but the uh, silver eyes really like the perching spot that the rock provides them to. Um, so bird baths are going to be a fantastic way to get birds into your garden. I know um, over our summer birds in backyard survey, we asked, um, we were investigating whether um, gardens that had water provided were going to attract more birds than gardens that didn't have water in them. Um, and we actually found that 90% of our people who were doing our surveys had put water out for birds. And so particularly through summer, that's a really important resource that we can provide. Um, and it's fantastic to see that so many people do it. Just finally, before I get to your questions, I'm just going to cover off on nest boxes. Um, in suburbia, um, there is a very much a shortage of natural tree hollows uh, because it takes a long time uh, for trees to form hollows, generally 60, 80 plus years, of course, longer if you're looking at a big hollow. Um, and by that stage, when they're forming hollows, they're often dropping limbs. And so these trees get removed because they can be dangerous. Nest boxes are the alternative that we can provide for some birds uh, to um, make up for that lack of resource. And we're talking about something like 15 to 17% of Australian native birds will use hollows or, um, for breeding or for shelter. We don't have nest box plans for all of those birds, but there are some that we know where we know the types of nest box alternatives we can provide for them. Um, so little finches and the like, sadly, um, are not going to use a nest box. And, you know, it's not sort of like cases in the UK where the little tits and things will come and use little, little houses. Our little native birds don't tend to do that. The exception is the, the little pardalotes. Um, but there are a range of parrots. There are owls, wood ducks, kookaburras will use nest hollows. And so we can create nest boxes for them. Of course, the birds don't make it easy for us. Um, they like to create um, a different, they, they like different shaped hollows. So they're going to like different shaped nest boxes. So you need to do a, have a bit of a think about the type of bird that you want to use your nest box. So you know that you go and get the right one. Um, you'll find, so the, like the image I showed you previously, the kookaburra, there he is. He uses a different shaped nest box to the one you would traditionally think of. He uses quite a long nest box rather than something that's quite deep. Um, of course, your parrots tend to use a standard um, parrot long box. Um, make sure that the nest box, whether you're buying it or whether you're building it yourself, um, has got things like drainage holes in it um, and has got the sloping roof so the water drains away. Um, make sure too that you can maintain them. And you can, of course, you know, look online and buy nest boxes from a whole range of different places, um, or you can build them. So we've got plans on the Birds in Backyards website for about 13 different species um, of birds. We've got the nest box plans on there. Um, so feel free to take a look at those. Um, we're about to just tweak them a little bit, but the basic premise is there. Um, so by all means, have a look now and keep an eye out for the updates. Um, so you can build those boxes and put them up. It's really important though that you maintain a nest box. So while it's a, a relatively um, easy activity to do over a weekend to build a box, when you put it up, you need to be able to maintain it. So you need to get it up to a height that you can safely access it. Um, but you also need to make sure that you are not creating a space for some problem species. So if you get sometimes feral bees, moving into your nest box, um, please contact an apiarist and they will come and remove them for you. Um, but keep an eye out for things like common or Indian miners and starlings in particular. So a couple of introduced birds that will take advantage of a nest box and move in, even if there are other birds using it, sadly. 
So make sure you can get up to it and remove the nesting material of those introduced birds if they are starting to take over. Um, you might need to block the hole up if they are being really persistent, um, but just make sure that you maintain those nest boxes. It's sadly not a set and forget situation. You put that nest box up, you need to be responsible for what's going on in it. Uh, of course, there's some great cameras and things around now. So wildlife cams, you can keep an eye on what's going on in your nest box up close and personal without having to actually get right up to the box. Um, so I'm going to um, answer some questions now. Um, but just to summarise and give a little bit more information. So go to um, birdsinbackyards.net, as I said before, for any more information. Uh, we've got a creating spaces section that's got a whole heap of articles in there for you on bird friendly gardening it's got the nest box plans it's got info on bird baths um, and think about doing a birds in backyard survey for us um, that would be a, a tremendous help um, all it takes is 20 minutes in your garden watching the birds if you don't know the name of the birds don't panic the bird data portal and the bird data app have um, a great feature in there so when you go and bring up your survey list it will actually give you um, a list of about 30 birds that are found in your area with photos so that's a great starting point to help you out you also add a bit of garden information so you know if you have mostly native plants if you've got mostly introduced plants if you feed birds if you've got water out for birds what sort of garden you've got all that information goes in as well and it helps us you know create habitat preferences for different types of birds and really you know, helps get that message out there about bird friendly gardening because we know exactly what they want because we're getting the data from you. You can also um, register for a Birds in Backyards newsletter. So you go to creating a Bird Life Australia account to do that um, and you select the, the e-newsletter. We send a newsletter once a quarter that has all sorts of information on what we're up to, uh, Bird friendly gardening is always in there, information about different types of birds that you might be seeing in your space and how to take action for them. We've got one coming out at the end of May, so go and register now so you don't miss out on that. I'm going to answer some questions now, so I'm really excited to see what you're sending me. Uh, I'll take a quick look. Okay, so should I defer, should I deter non-native species? Um, depends on what you mean by deter. Um, so there are a range of introduced birds that do really well with us and sometimes that can be to the detriment of our native birds. Um, so particularly things like the common or Indian minor, um, they can, as I said, overtake nest hollows um, and that of course causes problems for hollow nesting species. Um, do some research as to what's going on in your area. There, there are um, Indian minor trap um, traps that are available even though it's a non-native species it does mean you, you are required to euthanize um, introduced birds that you might be trapping use, using those traps humanely um, so take them to a vet or look at the appropriate protocols that um, are required to do that if you do want to go down that road um, those trapping programs um, can sometimes do well um, I think sometimes the issue is that one trap in one garden often isn't enough. So if you remove Indian miners from your garden, you may simply pre be creating a vacuum that um, encourages, you know, more just to move in because there's some space there for them to fill. So don't, um, don't expect a miracle cure um, from introduced species. If you are going to trap, think about the habitat as well because the, we want to be discouraging um, introduced species, but we also want to be encouraging natives. So it's no point just removing some introduced species if you still don't have the habitat that native birds need to survive. So get those plants in the ground. We know that introduced species prefer gardens with non-native vegetation. Native birds prefer gardens that have got native vegetation in them. Put the shrubs in. These are birds that, that like being around your house and like being out in open lawn space a lot of the time. So by creating that structure, you are not only creating a great space for native birds, but you're creating a space that the introduced birds don't like as much. Also be sure that if you are feeding pets outside, that you're removing um, the food. And so don't leave dog food out there, don't leave cat food out there. Bring even the bowls inside after you've finished feeding your animals. 
um, because then um, the Indian miners will come through and check that there's nothing there and they won't bother. I know if I forget and leave the dog food bowl out there, often I get them parading through and try and just check out and see what they've got um, to snap on. Um, advice for balconies. Um, so look, any plants that you can get on a balcony are going to be useful. So you can get um, particularly some little banksias and things um, in a dwarf form. You know, you can certainly um, pot up a lot of those native plants um, that are smaller and, and decorate your balcony and make them nice and green um, quite easily with native plants. We do have um, a, an article on the Birds in Backyards website on gardening in small spaces and gardening on a budget as well. So um, check that out. Absolutely get some vegetation in there. Um, and you will get some things visiting you. You know, sulphur-crested cockatoos love checking out a balcony. Um, so um, you will absolutely get some things visiting you. Just get some plants out there. Um, advice on noisy miner deterrence. Ooh. Um, so noisy miners are the native honey eater. Um, just because a bird is native doesn't mean it's also always a um, positive thing to have in your space. Um, noisy miners absolutely are full of personality, but they're also full of aggression. And we know that they will actively um, chase away other birds from their territories. And these um, noisy miners are a little bit unusual for honey eaters. They're not nomadic, like a lot of honey eaters are. They set up territories. They set up multi multi-family territories and they will actively chase away other birds from them. We know that if you are smaller than a noisy miner, you really struggle to coexist with them. So think about, um, as I said, avoiding some of those really big nectar producing plants um, and maybe putting in some canopy trees that are not necessarily eucalypts. We know that they um, don't like those as much. Um, and we also know that, as I said, they like um, some open grassy understory and some tall trees. So getting that shrub layer back in, while it might mean that, um, you know, if your garden is part of a noisy minor territory, you won't get rid of them entirely. Um, you will create some space that other birds can hide out in um, and the noisy miners will not like visiting your garden quite as much. We haven't really got the formula for um, discouraging them entirely yet, um, but there are some things that you can try uh, as well. Um, so I think looking at the time, we might leave it there. Um, if you've got any questions at any time, as I said, the Birds in Backyards website you can go to. Um, please check it out. There's also a contact us section on there. And so feel free to pop us an email at any time. That will come through to the Urban Birds team here at BirdLife Australia. And we're happy to answer your questions on creating great bird-friendly spaces. I hope you've really enjoyed today. Please make sure to tune in next week because we will have um, Millie Formby joining the Burning at Home series. It's going to be World uh, Migratory Bird Day. So she's going to be giving you lots and lots of fantastic uh, um, information about some of the extraordinary um, migratory shorebirds in particular that use Australia for at least part of the year. So please check it out. I hope you've really enjoyed today. Take care of yourselves while we're in isolation. Um, take advantage of the fact that we're in isolation and get out in the garden. Autumn is a fantastic time to be putting plants in the ground um, ahead of winter. It's really the ideal time. So now that we're all at home, nobody has any excuse not to create a bird-friendly garden. Thank you very much for joining me, everyone. I hope you've had a great time. See you later.